Amen. Good morning. You guys doing well? You're not hallucinating. I am wearing shorts and sandals. Hey, would you take out your Bibles this morning and open to the book of Titus? If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. Titus is near the end of your Bible. Open to the very last book, the book of Revelation, and then turn to the left a little bit. You'll find the three chapters of Titus. We just started this book last week, and we're going to pick it up today at verse 5 of chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, there in verse 5, the Apostle Paul there, he writes to Titus and he says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables or commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure." But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Father, we need wisdom as we open the scriptures today to give us insight and understanding into this text. And you promised through the Apostle James that if anyone lack wisdom we could ask and you would give in abundance. So we pray, God, for your wisdom and direction, that Holy Spirit, you would guide us into all truth and teach us all things. Truly, wisdom comes from you. So God, teach us your word. Help us to apply it to our lives, that we would become more like you in our conduct. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all those agreed said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. At a certain point in his ministry, Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. They had been with Jesus long enough to observe his routines and the rhythms of his life to know that prayer was a central part of who he was. Now, Being with him daily, they could observe and listen to his teaching. They could see his manner of life. They could see the way that he ministered to people, the way he interacted with the religious, with the self-righteous, with the sinners. They could watch all of that. But prayer, at least the way that Jesus spoke of it, was essentially private. He talked in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, about going and praying in the secret place, in private. So they could see in Jesus' routines daily that He would separate from them to pray. But that was essentially private. They they weren't able to know the nature of his prayers. Whereas a lot of the rabbis of the day, they would pray publicly. They would pray out loud. People could hear the way that they prayed. But apparently with Jesus' prayers, they didn't get to see that, Jesus' disciples. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray just as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And so Jesus answers their request by giving them a prayer that has come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. It might better be called the Disciples' Prayer because he's instructing them, this is how you pray. It's recorded for us in Luke's Gospel in chapter 11. And it might be familiar to you if you've been around church for a while. He says to his disciples, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now there's a lot that could be said about this famous prayer. I don't have a ton of time to go into every line of it. We could probably do a series on all the lines that are here in this prayer. But there are three lines in the middle of the prayer that 
stand out to me. They're, they're audacious prayer requests. As Jesus instructs his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The instruction of Jesus to his disciples to pray this boldly implies that God's kingdom and his will, his rule and his plan, that those things are the best outcome for us. To tell his disciples that you should pray, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done here in my life, in this place, on earth as it already is in heaven. That's a bold prayer. Or it's a bold instruction to pray in that way. It presumes that God's rule and God's plan are the best. And for the last 2,000 years, Christians have been praying these words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But not only have they been praying this, but they've been going into all of the world and proclaiming what we refer to as the gospel of the kingdom. The good news of God's rule over all humanity. That that is ultimately the best outcome for humanity. That's a pretty substantial claim to say that. Now, it's one thing to say that God's rule and his plan is best for humanity. It's an entirely different thing to demonstrate it. And here's one of the amazing things about the Christian faith, the gospel, the worldview that is the Christian faith, is that not only is there a claim that the rule and plan of God is the best for humanity, but it has been demonstrably true for the last 2,000 years. That where the gospel has gone, the good news of the kingdom, it has brought about better cultures, better communities, better societies. That literally is what we see. The gospel, it proves itself by what it produces. And where the gospel goes, society is better. That is, I believe, one of the, might we say, pragmatic proofs of the truth of the gospel. That where it goes, it betters society. Or, you know, stealing a play from Apple's playbook. It just works. The gospel works. It brings about transformation of individuals first, and then of families, and then families transform communities, and communities transform entire cultures. That is what we observe as Christianity has gone into all the world over the last 2,000 years. It's an amazing proof of the gospel. Well, the question is why? Why does the gospel result in better societies? And I believe that At least part of the answer to that question is found in the passage that's before us here in Titus chapter 1. So looking again at verse 5, Paul says, For this reason, Titus, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul left a co-laborer of his by the name of Titus on the island of Crete in the middle of the Mediterranean, and he left him there for a very specific purpose. You are to set in order the things that are lacking and establish leaders over the churches. So he is essentially the bishop, the overseer of all the churches that would occupy that island, and he's there to establish the structure for the leadership of those churches. Now, Titus was able, through most of his adult life, to watch Paul do this. He was with Paul during portions of his first missionary journey. He was clearly with Paul during portions of his second and third missionary journeys. All of this is recorded in what's called the book of Acts in the New Testament. So Titus was able to see with his own eyes how Paul would plant a church and then how he would establish and structure the leadership of that. So when Paul and Titus came to the island of Crete and Paul knowing he couldn't be there for a long period of time, he says, Titus, listen, I have to go. You're going to stay. I'm handing the baton to you. You're going to do what I have done every other place that you've seen me do it. Now, here's the difficulty. Here's the problem. The natives of the island of Crete were not known for their good character. He even references that here in this passage. Skip a few verses down to verses 12 and 13. We'll talk more about this in a moment. But notice what Paul says about the Cretans, the natives of the island of Crete. And I I think it's interesting that Cretan, C-R-E-T-A-N, the natives of Crete, is close to the English Cretan, C-R-E-A-T-I-N, which has an interesting meaning. So there's some interesting things going here. One of them, the natives of Cretan, this is Titus chapter 1, verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul adds this little editorial. This testimony is true. (laughs) So... 
This was the baseline for the people. These are the people that Titus gets to choose from to ordain elders in every city. They were known for being dishonest, they were known for being cruel, and they were known for being lazy. Dishonest, cruel, and lazy. Now, would it be a stretch to say that life in a culture that was like this, dishonest, cruel, and lazy, is life that is suboptimal? Not as it could be, not as it should be. Not the best. I I think that that would be safe to assume that that would not be the best place. And yet Jesus, when he was here in the Gospel of John chapter 10, he makes this great claim. I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. You'd have it better. So he says, I've come to bring the gospel, good news, of the kingdom. My rule, my authority, my plan. And if you place yourself under my rule, Christ is your Lord. As soon as you put your trust in Jesus and you say he is your Lord, you bend the knee, if you will, to Christ's leadership, you have now become a part of his kingdom. And he says, if you become a part of my kingdom, you will experience life better than the alternatives that are there. And it's not just a promise of life that is better after death. You see, a lot of times Christians think of it as, well, eternal life is what happens when I die here, then I'm going to enter into paradise and things will be so much better. But Jesus speaks of life that is abundant now, not just in the future. And so how does that happen? Well, we are instructed to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, in my life, in my community, as it already is in heaven. And the experience of the outworking of his kingdom and his will being done on earth as it is in heaven That is to take place through the expression of God's kingdom, and the expression of God's kingdom is within his church. That's where we are to see the outworking of his rule and his plan. And so this is why Titus, while he's left in Crete, is to establish the church, which is the expression of God's kingdom here on earth, and he is to set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as he was instructed to do. So the structure ordained or appointed within the church is a necessary component for the proper experience, the proper expression of the kingdom of God, the manifestation of his kingdom. And so for that to take place in the right way, he says you need to set in order things that are lacking. You get to create order. And within that order, you need to have a hierarchy of leadership. There needs to be leaders within that order. Brings us to point one. Ordered communities require leaders authorized to give orders. Now, we have a problem with that. We have a problem with that as Americans living in the 21st century. Because, I don't know if you've noticed, but Americans tend to have an anti-authoritarian bent. Do you feel it? And, And what we see in our own nation over the last 60 years, has been, well, many of you who grew up and went through the time called the 60s and the 70s, there was an anti-establishment bent that has permeated all of American culture. And so we live in a culture that has kind of like coded into our American genetic code is this anti-authoritarian bent. We don't like hierarchies. And it's amazing because All the research, politically, demographically, of our society over the last 25 years has shown this to be very clear. Whether you identify on the left as Democrat or on the right as Republican, all Americans are increasingly becoming libertarian in their view. And what is a libertarian view? It is a mindset that I am my own authority, that I have civil liberties. And so there is a a move in all political spheres in the United States over the last 25 years towards a libertarian bent. Now, this is not new. And in fact, you can, you can observe a libertarian bent in every two-year-old. <laughs> it's there. It, it's in them. I, I saw this in a beautiful way. My wife and I did uh, with our young... We still sing it, but it was, it, was, uh, it was cute when Evangeline was like two and three. And we have a video of her going around saying, I do it all by myself. I do it all by myself. And there is in us, just by nature, this bent towards just a, a libertine kind of mindset. And we see it in our own nation. Now, 
There are political idealists in philosophical classes, academic classes in our nation that say that that's ultimately what is needed. Whether you align on the left or on the right, we need to move towards this. And those that are in this philosophical area of political idealism, they say the ideal is for libertarianism to go to its furthest point, which is called what? Anarchy. Anarchy. And what is anarchy? Anarchy is the state of disorder due to absence of no and non-recognition of authority. The absence of government and absolute freedom of the individual. Now, it's very important for us to understand. There are some voices in our culture that saying that's what we need to get to. But those who hold that philosophical, political ideal, they have at the foundation of that this concept. All human beings are inherently good. That's where this concept of like, this is the political ideal comes from. And if left to their good nature, everything will be just great. Here's the problem. History does not bear that out at all. And not only does history not bear that out, but the scriptures make very clear why history does not bear that out because of something that we refer to as original sin. We all are fallen. And so if you, if you in your mind go, I just don't think that ultimately that will be a good outcome, that's probably because you had, have children. You see, people who, who have that mindset, people are inherently good, they have that in college before they have kids. And then they have kids, and they realize that they didn't have to teach their kids to be dishonest. How many of you taught your kids to lie? For the record, there's not a hand up. And yet they do that by nature. How many of you had to teach your children to be mean to their sibling? It's there. Dishonest, cruel, lazy. Did you teach your kids to do that? No, it's by nature. It's there. It's part of who we are. So that's a problem. So if we are going to have societies, cultures, communities that thrive, there needs to be what? Order to that society. And for there to be order, there needs to be leaders authorized to give orders in that society. And we have a problem with that because we're concerned about who those leaders will be. None of us have any problem with authority if we're in charge. But as soon as we say there needs to be an order to society and authority within society, we say, okay, well, we, we're concerned about who those leaders will be. That concern is not without merit. So look at what Paul says. He addresses the issue of leaders within society, community, specifically the, the expression of the kingdom of God, which is the church. He gives these instructions about qualifications for leaders. Verse 6, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So the first thing Paul says is actually a challenge to our current cultural moment. Just the first five words of his qualifications for leaders, he says this, if a man is blameless and we have a, a real cultural battle point in 21st century American culture just in those first five words, but then in the whole of this qualifications of leaders given here, because see, when you look at these qualifications for leaders in the original language, you find that every descriptive word, not greedy, sober-minded, every descriptive word is in the masculine in Greek. And so we have an issue. We have a problem. Because there is a battle that's been going on in our culture for a very long time about the issue of gender roles and gender position. And, and there are those in our culture that are the loudest voices of this whole issue of gender equality. And they say the problem in Western culture is the Judeo-Christian value. And they point to passages like this and they say, see this breeds this problematic, evil, dominance hierarchy. This right here breeds this patriarchal cu uh, culture that we're fighting against. So that is the assertion of some within our culture, that we have a major issue here in this passage, and it goes right back to something that Americans in 21st century life, Westerners in 21st century life, have a real hard time with. Hierarchies of authority, and especially what is referred to as the patriarchy. And they say this passage, and others like it, are quintessentially patriarchal. 
And so how do we deal with it? Well, first, I think it's very important for us, every time we have this discussion, and our culture is talking about this quite a bit, it is important for us to acknowledge and to push, promote, that the Bible teaches the dignity of all human beings, whether male or female, from the very beginning. Now, people say, I don't agree with that. Well, they don't agree with the ways in which certain people, according to our fallen nature, have interpreted things, because you can interpret things out of context to promote inequality. But even from the very opening words of the Bible, do you realize in the creation narrative, God establishes the the essential dignity of men and women together as equal. How does he do this? Well, even in the creation of woman, he created man in his image, and then he created woman. How did he do that? He took from Adam's what? The original language says from his side. Now, we we translate in English from his rib. But it says from his side. And I find it interesting that God did not take from man's foot so that he would tower over woman. He did not take from his head so that she would be over him. But he took from his side so that they would be joined together as one, as partners. There is an essential dignity from the very beginning. And we know that because why? Wherever the Bible has gone for the last 2,000 years, we have seen the elevation of dignity of women in those cultures. If you look at the world today and you assess sociologically, anthropologically, human groups, culture groups, where do we see the greatest equality between men and women? In cultures that have been influenced by the Bible. That is without a doubt what we see. So, if that's the outcome, then there must be something more nuanced to the story when we hear people in our culture saying, the Bible creates unequal hierarchies and subjugates women. The Bible does not. It does not at all. The Bible never calls for or teaches the subjugation of women. But people will say, yes, but it does talk about submission. Okay, it does. But it says that a woman, this is important, should submit, must submit to her own husband. Every time the Bible talks about female submission, it talks about a woman of submission to her own husband. And we need to emphasize that little itty bitty word, own, which is interesting because those letters stand for a women's network and we need to drive home. (laughs) To her own husband. The Bible also teaches that an ordered authority within the church is necessary for the proper expression of the kingdom of God But that ordered authority within the church is for all Christians, whether they be male or female. And so God does call for that. It is nearly impossible for there to be a submission to this authority if we do not have this, that the leaders be blameless. Paul says, if a man is blameless, and he drives this point home twice because he emphasizes it by saying it twice. Look at verses six and seven. If a man is blameless, skip down to verse seven, for a bishop overseer must be blameless. So we say, we have a hard time with with, uh, authority because we want to make sure that the leaders are good leaders. And God through Paul says, yes, that's what we want. And so we want people to occupy these positions of authority, leadership within the order of God's kingdom expression on earth, the church, they need to be blameless. Another word for blameless is above reproach. Another translation says, men of unquestioned integrity. Point number two on your outline. Societies thrive when their leaders are focused upon righteousness. And and let's acknowledge the obvious. Communities. Churches, Christian communities, they will willingly yield submission to the order and authority in the church when those leaders are pursuing righteousness. Does that mean that the leaders will always be perfectly righteous? No. Why? Because we are fallen human beings. But those leaders need to be those who are pursuing righteousness in their lives. And so Paul says, if a man is blameless, for a bishop must be blameless. They must be pursuing rightness, righteousness in their lives. Lives. 
And so not only must an elder be blameless, but Paul writes there in verse six, there must be blameless the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. This blameless integrity and righteousness of those leaders that will occupy these roles within the order of the church, the kingdom of God's expression here upon the earth, this righteousness, this integrity, it needs to be displayed first in the home. And this is important because it's very possible and plausible that a person can appear to be one of integrity. They can appear to be someone who is righteous and blameless on stage, if you will, when they're out in front of other people. And have we not seen in our culture, whether it's leaders of organizations or corporations or political leaders or even church leaders who appeared to be good, righteous, blameless, out in front of everybody else, but then it becomes clear that they aren't that way at home. There's a duplicitousness in the way that they live. And we refer to that when someone is one thing in front of other people and another thing when they're at home, we refer to that with a big word that starts with the letter H and it's what? Hypocrite. Comes from the Greek hypocritus, which is an actor. And so we, we know that this takes place. And so Paul says those who are going to occupy these leaders of authority within the church, they need to be blameless, and they need to be blameless first at home. In, in Paul's same exhortations to Timothy about the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he adds this parenthetical note, for if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? When a leader functions well within the home, then Paul says, we, we see that there is integrity, not just in front of people on the stage, but it's at home as well. Point number three, the best communities have leaders that are committed to their spouse and family. And, and it brings us to a point that's really, really important. This point emphasizes a truth that our culture fights against, but that is evidentially clear. You can see it in the evidence of research, and that is that lifelong monogamy is good for society. It's good for society. And, and even those who would be counted as secular researchers in academic sciences, social sciences, they have seen this time and time again, that lifelong monogamy is good for a society to thrive. And when there is not that, and we, we have had a grand experiment. The United States of America has been a laboratory to test this hypothesis for the last 60, 70 years in our nation as we have basically deconstructed this whole thing. One of the byproducts of what is called the sexual revolution in the 1960s is that we have come against this idea that monogamy Monogamy is important. And we see the outcomes. Has it helped society? I don't think it has. And so what we've seen is we've seen our society trying to deal with the outcomes, all the symptoms of this root problem, and throw politics at it and throw money at it. And we try to fix all the symptoms. But in reality, lifelong monogamy is good for the thriving of society. In fact, we know, research has shown, secular academic research, federally funded research, proves time and time again that children that grow up in the home of a two-parent family with a mom and a dad do better than those that do not. And so it makes sense that the best communities have leaders that are committed to their spouse and to their family. Every study has proven this, even though our culture wants to fight against it. Why? Because I don't want authority over me. I don't want someone to tell me that that's important, that I should be committed to this spouse till death do us part. I want to do what I want to do. I want libertarian kind of philosophy, anytime, anywhere. Open marriages, the 21st century newest expression. Let's see how that works. I can tell you right now, it's not going to work well. Why? Look at history. There have been other places that have tried it. And, you know, I mentioned it last week. One of the problems with us is that we are so focused on the present, we forget the past. But there's a lot to be learned from the past. And we realize that, well, that's been tried, and it didn't work. So... Let's see how that works. It won't. Now, what does this blameless example look like? This person who's going to occupy this position of authority within the ordered structure of the church, which is the expression of the kingdom of God here upon earth, what, what should they look like? Give us some parameters, Paul. He says this, verse 7 and 8. This person is a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, and self-controlled. First and foremost, this person needs to be a steward of God. They need to recognize that the position that they occupy is not theirs by possession. 
It's not theirs to hand off to other people when they choose or to their own children or whatever it may be. It is God's church, God's kingdom, and the leader there is placed as a manager or a steward. And every time that a leader begins to think that this is mine, they begin to take from that which is theirs in a way that is in line with greed, which is spoken against in this passage. So he says, a steward of God. They're not lords, they're ministers, they're servants. Not self-willed. This person must not be arrogant or overbearing. Not quick-tempered. Another translation says, not soon angry. The antithesis to quick-tempered would be slow to anger, patient, long-suffering. The person who's going to occupy that position should have this character quality. They're not given to wine. This is a person who's an alcoholic, a drunkard. Another tra- or the, the Thayer's Greek lexicon on this word, this Greek word not given to wine, it says that this person is to not be quarrelsome over wine, hence brawling or abusive. Now here's the amazing thing. Studies have shown that above 80% of domestic abuse is connected to alcohol abuse. That <laughs> now we have all these people that are able to video everything at any moment. And there's all these videos on YouTube, people fighting with each other. It always seems to happen on the beach. You know, summertime, it's hot, people are going to be fighting on the beach. In nearly every one of those fights, what is at the core of it? Alcohol. Now, is drinking alcohol a sin? Drinking alcohol, the Bible, does not make it a sin. But being drunk with wine is a sin. And here's the amazing thing. It is the only substance that seems to also promote violence. So that's a danger. Not helpful. Probably not a good thing. And and you know, it's interesting to me. I read an article about 10 years ago. The number one city in the United States for the highest alcohol consumption per capita. You know what it is? Washington, (laughs) D.C. That was 10 years ago. I don't know if the the numbers are still valid, but that's interesting. Should tell us something. Maybe not a good thing. And so not given wine. Not violent. Of course, this follows in line with that. This person's not a bruiser. Another word that is connected to this idea of not violent is not pugnacious. Now, that's a word we need to add back into our modern lexicon. Not greedy. A greedy person is one who's always looking for what's in it for them. This is a self-centered person who thinks it's all about them. But the, the leader who will occupy a position of authority within the order of God's expression of his kingdom here upon the earth, the church, is a person who, like Jesus, exemplifies this, that Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man out for his own things, but every man also for the things of others. And then he adds to this that the person is not only, well, not greedy. This is an interesting thing. Our culture wants to deal with inequality of outcomes. And so one of the ways that our culture wants to deal with inequality of outcomes is to deal with this problem of greed with more greed. How do we do that? I'm going to deal with your issues of greed by taking from you and giving to other people to equal the distribution. What does the Bible teach? How does the Bible deal with this inequality? Because there is inequality. We have to acknowledge there's inequality. How does the Bible teach, with, teach to deal with it? Well, look at the very next word. Not greedy. He moves from the negative to the positive. He says, this person who's going to occupy this position of leadership needs to be hospitable. Hospitable is essentially the antithesis of greedy. It's a person who has something and is willing to share it with other people. And the word that's translated hospitable here is literally a lover of hospitality. One who loves to give what they have to share with other people. How do you deal with unequal distributions? Well, there's two possible hypotheses. One, take from those who have and give to those who don't. And that creates all kinds of loving feelings in a culture. (laughs) Or another is to promote the mindset of hospitality and to promote the heart of giving. And who gave more than our God? He who gave his only begotten son. He spared not his own son. How shall he not freely give us all things? That's our example. And so he says that these who will occupy these positions of leadership need to be hospitable. They also need to be a lover of what is good. A promoter of virtue is another way of saying it. They need to be sober-minded. That is a person who's clear-headed, sensible, not impulsive. 
Someone who is just. The, the implied meaning between, behind just seems to be someone who is seeking to live right before their fellow human beings. And then the very next word is holy. What's the difference between just and holy? Well, one is living horizontally before other people. Holy seems to be someone who's seeking to live right before God. You see, you can appear just before other people and still be unholy before God. So the Christian leader needs to be one who's seeking to be both just and holy. And finally, he says, someone who is self-controlled. They know how to control themselves. Now, I think that every one of these things that's listed, whether in the negative, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, or in the positive, hospitable, a lover of what is good, every one of these things listed here is objectively good for the thriving of society. Would you not willingly yield to the authority of a person who is seeking to live in this way? By God's grace, I would. And, and every society where you remove any of these things is a society that is quickly destabilized. Look at the laboratory that is the United States of America in the last half century. We have the empirical data. We live it every single day. Well, he goes on in verse 9. This person who'd occupy this position needs to hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Point number four, strong societies must have an objective standard of sound doctrine, which is something that the Western society in the 21st century is, is significantly lacking as we have continued to move very quickly into what has been referred to as a postmodern society, wherein every sort of truth claim is relative. And so you have your truth and I have my truth. And when everything is relative, there is no objective standard and no one can say, that's wrong, because who are you to say that's wrong? And then we have people who objectively make the statement, you have no right to say that's wrong. Well, is that wrong? That's an objective statement. And so we have a problem. We have a culture that is unmoored from any objective standard. But God says, I am calling you to pray for and to promote my kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So within the confines of the church, which is the representation, the manifestation of God's kingdom here upon the earth, he says, you need to have an objective standard of sound doctrine. And those who are in the positions of authority, they need to know how to rightly use that objective standard of sound doctrine so that they may be able, with sound doctrine, to exhort and convince those who contradict. So what's the problem? It seems like everything should be great, right? Right? Well, look at verse 10. Well, there are many insubordinate, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, or we might say, especially those who are religious. Even within religious groups, there are people who are insubordinate, idle talkies, talkers, deceivers. Their mouths must be stopped. They subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. So what's the problem? Point number five on your outline. Our fallen nature opposes what is actually beneficial and good. The problem is us. Now, just imagine for a moment. Paul says, hey, Titus, I'm going to leave you here. I got, to look, I got to go. You set things in order. Appoint elders. Oh, by the way, all the people that you have to choose from are dishonest, cruel, and lazy. So uh, go to it. I'll see you later. That's the pool from which he's going to pull leaders to be just and holy and temperate and not drunkards, he says, yeah, go to it, Titus. How on earth do you do that? Because I guarantee you, the Cretans of Crete, the natives, who were dishonest, cruel, and lazy, they were no more so than the other people that lived in Greece or Asia Minor or Rome of the first century, no more so than those that live in the United States in the 21st century. We all are, by nature, dishonest, cruel, and lazy. So what do you do? How do we deal with this? Well, look at what he says, verse 13, the second half of it. This is amazing. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in conduct. Is that what it says? No. But that's what we try to do, isn't it? I'm going to beat you with the Bible. I'm going to rebuke you sharply until you make your life better. Fix it. Just get better. 
Stop being dishonest. Stop being lazy. Stop being cruel. I'm going to beat you with the Bible. That, that, that's been the mindset of humanity. Rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in what? Faith. It's striking to me that he doesn't say sound in conduct. I mean, you, you would assume. He's just said we need people who have good conduct. Where does good conduct come from? Sound conduct comes from sound faith. He goes on, verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables or the commandments of men who turn from the truth. Because to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. If you take defiled people, people whose fallen natures are broken, and you try to make them pure, you can't do it. You can't produce good fruit from a bad tree. This is the teaching of Jesus. And so how do we deal with the problem of a bad tree? He says they need to be sound in faith. Because even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You can't make bad people, fallen people, do good works without a radical transformation of the heart to make them genuinely good. And that comes through how? Well, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. They have sound faith in the good word, the good gospel of God. God's gospel, the good news, is able to transform human beings. How? God deals with the heart. He takes out that broken, fallen, defiled heart, and he gives us a new heart. How does he do this? Jesus made it possible by his broken body and his shed blood, which is why for the last 2,000 years, the church has regularly remembered the body and blood of Jesus Christ through partaking of communion. You see, we want sound societies, societies that thrive, societies that experience and express the abundant life that Jesus came to give, but that is only experienced through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so it's important for us, and we're going to partake of communion in just a moment, to remind ourselves that we can be these kind of people and this kind of expression of the kingdom of God by the grace of Jesus at work in us because he died for our sins to give us a new heart. His body was broken. His blood was shed. We partake of the, the bread to remind us of his body, the cup to remind us of his blood. And so I'm going to invite the worship leaders to come back up here, and they're going to lead us in a song, and our ushers are going to pass out the bread and the cup. Just take the bread, take the cup, hold on to them, and in a few minutes we'll partake together as we remember his body that was broken, his blood that was shed. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the power that you have to make us new that if anyone is in you, Jesus, they are a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. And you, Jesus, are able to do that in us. You take us who at our nature are dishonest and lazy and cruel, and you transform us so that we can be sober and tempered and good and holy and just. God, thank you for that. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our lives, and in our church, as it is in heaven. And that we would know and experience that abundant life that you came to give and that you made possible for your, through your body and through your blood. We remember you today. In Jesus' name.